Hey guys, welcome back to Reserved Investments on YouTube, and I hope you're all having a joyous holiday season. Here's to a new and exciting 2022. Hopefully, pandemic-wise, it's better than the last few years. That's all I'm going to say on that because I don't want to jinx it. So what I'm going to be talking about in this particular video, if you guys are unaware, um, Harry Rinker, who is one of the foremost experts in the field of antiques and collectibles, is pretty much going to be retiring to a certain degree, and he's no longer going to be writing regular articles like he has been in the past. Now, to be fair to Harry Rinker, he's 80 years old. I mean, at this particular point, it's understandable that the man wants to probably slow down a little bit, or at least his family wants him to slow down a little bit. Now, to be fair, Harry Rinker has been a major influence on a lot of the mentors that mentored me in my knowledge in the overall antiques and collectibles trade. And I'm going to go a step further, and I'm going to say that he has had an influence on myself and my own career in the antiques and collectibles trade, especially as a columnist for Antiques and Auction News. So I give the man a lot of credit. I can probably tell he's most likely not a fan of this particular YouTube channel because I get the feeling that, and again, I don't want to put words in Mr. Rinker's mouth at all, but I do get the feeling that he doesn't like the investment and the speculation aspect of the trade meaning the fact that there's so many investors, speculators right now that are coming into the trade just seeing dollar signs in their eyes. As a matter of fact, the article that I'm going to take you through today goes into that in a little bit of detail where you can kind of see a little bit of that disdain. Now, that's nothing against Harry Rinker. We all have our different perspectives, our different viewpoints, and our different beliefs in a lot of these markets. To be fair, Harry Rinker, I think, is spot on in most of his analysis of the antiques and collectibles trade. And that's why I keep trying to introduce him to you guys, especially you younger guys that are new to the trade. So in the description of this video below is going to be a link to this article. And the article is entitled Top 10 Changes in the Antiques and Collectibles Field Over the Last 35 Years. Now, this is a fairly long article. I am not going to read it verbatim. What I am going to do is I'm going to go through. I'm going to pick out some of the most prominent top 10 changes that occurred in the last 35 years that Harry Rinker commented on here. I'm going to give you my assessment, and I'm going to also read what Harry originally wrote. But make no mistake, I want you guys to read this article in full if you do have the time to do so. It is going to enlighten you. It is going to at least broaden your horizons. I've said this before, and I will say it again. A lot of you out there are very naive as to how the antiques and collectible trade operates from a financial standpoint, not only over the short term, but also over the long term. Getting perspectives from people who have been in the trade for 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years in certain instances is going to help you at least have a better perspective as to the pros and cons of investing in these markets. Because remember, guys, when we invest in antiques and collectibles, there is an opportunity cost to this. And this is something that I don't think a lot of the hype-driven YouTubers out there, a lot of the people that are so focused on cryptocurrency, collectibles, all of that stuff that really doesn't provide any type of a revenue stream. A lot of people don't realize that if you're going to talk about investing in Pokemon cards or comic books or video games or rare coins, at the end of the day, you do have to compare that asset class to the overall strength, to the overall gains of other asset classes that are traditional in sense, meaning mutual funds, ETFs, stocks, bonds, other asset classes that you can put your money in. Because again, it comes down to the time value of money and the opportunity cost of investing in these markets. Regardless of not, if you consider yourself a collector, a dealer, a speculator, an investor. And there's going to be more videos on that as we enter the year 2022, because I think it's very important. I've said this before. This is the last thing I'll say before I get to the crux of this video. 97% of you, on average, watching this video right now, 
would be better off putting your money in a total stock market index fund, an S&P 500 index fund, some type of financial asset other than antiques and collectibles. And I know a lot of you don't want to hear that because you think all these collectibles, they just continue to go up and up. I'm sorry. Once you peel back the height, and you actually study these markets over the past, even if you only go back 20 years, you're going to see that is not the case. A lot of these markets are on fire right now simply because speculation, YouTubers, even like myself, hype-driven social media influencers, auction houses, collecting forums, all colliding together to tell you, hey, this is a viable investment. You need to put your money in this. It's just like what's happening with cryptocurrency, guys. And I'm really, really taken back by the amount of hype, by the amount of speculation, by the amount of new money that is flowing into the trade. You know, guys, I commented on this as well in the past. And a lot of you guys really don't listen to me when I state this. There's a reason why a lot of Wall Street insiders now want to own auction houses and grading companies in the antiques and collectibles trade. They're doing that because they see it as a viable revenue stream because a lot of people, rather than putting their money in gold or silver or crypto or stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, real estate and the like, they're putting a lot of it in collectibles. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to capture that market share. And the easiest way to do that is to buy a grading company, buy an auction house, do something that is like the equivalent of selling shovels to gold miners back during the gold rush. That's really what a lot of these companies are doing. And I keep telling a lot of you guys out there, a lot of the people that are educated in finance on that end of the spectrum, know what they're doing. There's a reason why they themselves are not going after high-grade comic books or high-grade video games or Pokemon cards or Magic the Gathering. They're instead getting their money, their income streams from the grading of this stuff, from the buying and selling of it. And that's really something that you guys really need to think about, especially as we go forward into the year 2022, because I'm telling you, even before this year starts, I know there's going to be some more record-breaking sales, and I know there's going to be some surprises along the way. And I just hope that we do not enter a bear market in the collectible space anytime soon, because a lot of people out there are going to be hurting. So now that I said all that, I'm going to get right into the commentary points I want to make on this particular article. Again, there's going to be a link in the description below. The title of the article is Top 10 Changes in the Antiques and Collectibles Field Over the Last 35 Years. And this was written by Harry L. Rinker. So I'm going to need my glasses for this, guys. So please forgive me. And we're going to focus on consolidation's negative impact. This is actually number nine on his list. And I'm going to read what he wrote. In the first decade of the 21st century, large companies tried to create antiques and collectibles, vertical companies that included merchandising, periodical, publishing, and show divisions. Groups such as Chilton Books, Krauss, and Landmark gobbled up publishers, local and regional periodicals, and shows consolidation failed. The cost was the loss of almost all the purchased unit. A once rich and diverse antiques and collectibles periodical and publishing community disappeared. The antiques and collectibles trade thrives best on the independence of its component parts, a lesson that is often forgotten. And this is 100% true. Um, I don't know if a lot of you guys are aware of this, but even back in the early 2000s, late 1990s, there were a lot of auction firms that were trying to consolidate. And some of those firms consolidated better than others. Um, some of them that did consolidate ended up splitting again. And it's very interesting when you go back and study the reasons why they tried to consolidate, why it worked in certain instances, and why it worked in others. And I will state, guys, that'll be the subject of another video. I'm not going to get into that here. What I will say, though, is I'm sure we all agree that print media in the overall antiques and collectibles trade, and almost in any industry at this particular point in time, thanks to the rise of the internet, is just about dead at present time. I mean, if you walk into a Barnes & Noble 
or any bookseller for that matter. If you go to the antiques and collectibles section, you're going to notice that it is a fraction of its size currently in the year 2021, as we prepare to enter the year 2022, than it was back in the early 1990s. I mean, this should be no secret. There are a lot of publications, though, still being produced for some of the most popular collecting categories, whether it's rare coins, great at currency, uh, comic books. Obviously, every year, the Overstreet Price Guide is still printed and produced, just like the Red Book is still printed and produced for coins. So I will tell you, though, it's, it's getting to the point where print media, sadly, because I, again, I do write for Antiques and Auction News, so this does affect me, is really going by the wayside. And I really consider that to be something of a turning point in the overall trade if that occurs, because I'm really going to state this, guys, and I mean no disrespect to anybody out there, but the Antiques and Collectibles trade is not going to work as efficiently as it could if all we have is YouTube. Because there's a lot of hype-driven YouTubers out there that are pretty much serving their own interests. Where, at least if you're reading an article by Antiques and Auction News, some of these other publications, Antique Traders, a big one, even some of the coin publications. Most of the journalists, most of the people that write for those publications, their main goal is focused on the trade. They're not trying to pump and dump the market. And that's something that I will state is very important, ethics and transparency in this market by and large. So if we do lose print media in this particular business or field, we are going to have issues going forward if we're just stuck with the social media influencers along with hype-driven YouTubers. Now, I do want to focus on number eight. Number eight is vital. And this is called grading investors and speculators. And I do disagree with part of the point that Harry makes here. So please pay close attention, guys. I'm going to start reading. There is only one reason to grade antiques and collectibles. Market manipulation to attract potential investors and speculators. When antiques and collectibles become commodities instead of things to be loved, the trade suffers. Now, obviously, I do support third-party grading because it does bring confidence to the overall market. You guys heard me state that before, but I do agree. He's 100% correct that when antiques and collectibles become commodities instead of things to be loved, the trade does suffer. We're seeing that. Look what happened with a lot of you guys. You guys were really cheering on what it games, what was happening with great at video games. And I was sitting here telling you that this market looks to be manipulated. And a lot of you guys didn't want to take it seriously. Well, now you see that there are certain video games that are out of most people's reach to the point where they will never be able to afford them. So at the end of the day, the speculators, the investors, they got what they wanted. Did the collectors get what they wanted? Did the average gamer out there who just wants to own those particular items get what he or she wanted? The answer in most cases is no. I'm going to go on to read. Investor involvement and speculation is cyclical. This I agree with 100%, guys. Listen here. It disappeared briefly during the first decade of the 21st century, but returned with a vengeance in the past five years. Until the current speculative bubbles burst, and they certainly will, expect to see these individuals drive the high end in many collecting categories higher. Do you understand what is being said there? Again, guys, the entire antiques and collectibles trade, much like how I talk about the fact that collectibles are more linear, antiques are more cyclical, well, the entire trade is also cyclical. You are going to come to a point where we enter a bear market in a lot of these collecting categories. And I know a lot of you tell me, Sean, Super Mario isn't going to zero. Spider-Man isn't going to drop to zero. My beloved Planeswalkers of Magic the Gathering, they're not going to go to zero. You're absolutely right. But what could happen is a price correction could come, take hold of those markets, and those prices could pretty much be depressed for the next 20, 30, 40 years. It can happen, guys. Make no mistake, we are really in unpredictable waters right now with all this speculation and all this investment. 
The next one I do want to comment on is high end, now affordable to only the very few, because this kind of ties into what we're talking about. And this is number five on the list. Make no mistake. When the top item in a collecting category sells for $500 or less, it is affordable. When a half a million dollars or more is required to buy a top item, it is not. A list of collecting categories where the top item has exceeded one half million dollars would exceed 50 and is rapidly approaching 100. I have exceeded the $5,000 barrier, but not the $10,000 barrier in terms of purchase price. There are hundreds of categories where I cannot afford the best of the best. Given this, I find myself asking, why bother? And that's going to be the subject of another video that I actually have planned on this channel, guys. You know, a lot of you make the mistake. You see an Action Comics one sell for several millions of dollars, or you see a Batman one sell for several millions of dollars. And you think that if you own those books and you went to sell them in the open market, it would be very easy to find a buyer. That is 100% false, guys. The auction companies that cater to that high-end top tier level of the market, they literally have to do a lot of planning in advance. That's why when you can sign the Heritage when you can sign to certain other auction houses out there that are at the top of the trade, they will tell you it's probably going to take six months to 12 months for us to get this cataloged in a signature sale, promote the product properly, and then cut you a check and send you that check. Now, it's true. You can go to a dealer. You can try to find an individual buyer. But overall, make no mistake, very few people are able to spend half a million dollars, one million dollars, five million dollars, ten million dollars on an antique or collectible at any point in their lives. You are talking literally, in most cases, less than one percent of the overall population. This is why when we have conversations where I get into it with video game collectors or pop culture collectors or Pokemon collectors, and I have, I'm just going to use this as an example. I'm not trying to cut anybody up. We can put rare coins in here as well, if you guys would like. Every once in a while, I'll get a Timmy that makes forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, and he tells me that he is going to trade his entire collection. He's going to clear out a lot of his brokerage accounts. He's going to remortgage his house. And he is going to buy a quarter of a million dollar item or a half a million dollar item. And he'll ask me my advice. And I tell him, do not do it. I understand in your mind, you think that this is an investment grade item. At any given time, that market can shift. And number two, there are very few people who can afford to buy or play in that proverbial pond that you are about to water into. I want to state this, and I want to make this very clear. Do you know what the best tier of collectibles and antiques from a cost basic to invest in at the average level is? It's actually five to $10,000. Meaning if you want to put together an investment grade collection, most experts some would potentially disagree, possibly even Harry Ranker here, but most experts will tell you the coveted era or the coveted realm of cost basis to collect collectibles and antiques, if you want to go after a higher end market, is the five to $10,000 range. Meaning if you're going to the market, you want to buy a CGC graded key comic book, look for a comic book that's selling for five to $10,000. If you want to invest in rare coins, Look for a rare coin that's selling from five to $10,000. You want to invest in currency. Look for a piece of currency that's selling from five to $10,000. That is the sweet spot. And in an upcoming video, I'm going to explain to you why. The basic gist is the average person that makes fifty or $60,000 a year, if they wanted to splurge for one high top tier collectible in the five to $10,000 range, at least once a year, they could afford to do it. The same thing is true with the lawyer, the doctor, the young or older professional that's now making six figures. If they wanted to splurge at least once or twice a year for a five to $10,000 antique or collectible, they 
could do it. That's something that you guys got to learn. Having the most expensive, quote unquote, supposed valuable item in existence should not be the goal when you are investing in a lot of these items. And again, we're going to talk more about that as we go into the year 2022. Now, with that being said, there is one more thing I want to comment on here, and then I'm going to let you guys read the article in full. Number one is entitled The Digital Age. The digital age's impact on collecting and collectors is yet to be fully defined. It has brought in the marketplace and made it global, made buying opportunities a daily experience instead of a once or twice a month activity, expanded the buying marketplace at least tenfold, and increased the number of distinct specialized collecting categories from 1,500 to over 30,000. Yes, that's 100% true, guys. There are over tens of thousands individual collecting categories that make up the entire antiques and collectibles trade. Most people don't realize that. The digital age also has caused collector isolation, allowed unknowledgeable and disreputable sellers to enter the marketplace, and made it impossible to analyze current prices for the purpose of long-term forecasting. Let me read that last part again. And made it impossible to analyze current prices for the purpose of long-term forecasting. That is why when you guys come to me and you go, Sean, in 100 years from now, or even just 50 years from now, a copy of Action Comics 1 is going to be worth more than the U.S. Constitution. And I just roll my eyes and I sit there and think to myself, does this dude really think that he knows more than some of the top experts in the trade? Well, here's proof that you do not, if you are in that particular category, thinking that a copy of Auction Comics 1 is going to ever sell for more than an original copy of the U.S. Constitution. If you're wondering where I'm pulling that out of, I did a video where I talked about the U.S. Constitution, one of the 13 known original copies, sold for over $43 million. And literally, I had Timmy's in the comment section telling me that within 50 years, a copy of Action Comics 1 will sell for more than a copy of the U.S. Constitution. If you can predict that, you obviously know way more than me, and obviously you know more than Harry Rinker here. And I'm sorry, I do not think that that is possible at present time. I have been part of the antiques and collectibles community for 70 years, if you count my entire career. 54 years, if you start with my museum career, and 37 years, if you limit my term to my research and writing career. I have watched, observed, learned, and shared. And that's how this article pretty much ends. And I want to make this very clear that you all need to take some time to read this. There's going to be other videos that I'm going to be doing on previous articles that Harry Rinker has written that I have yet to cover on this channel. I do think he is a wealth of knowledge. I do think also, even if you don't agree 100% with his perspective, you should at least take the time to know his work. Thank you for watching. I hope you got something out of this. We are going to do a deeper dive on some of these topics in future videos. That's why I did not touch on all of them, guys. Make no mistake. However, please let me know what you think in the comment section below. Thank you and have a great night.